Museum Digit 2020. A Magyar Nemzeti Múzeum online virtuális konferenciája. Hello, my name is Brad Dunn, and I'm here to talk to you today about storytelling in museums. Let's jump right in. So museums, you have stories to tell. I know a lot of you watching this now are curators and collections managers, scientists um, at a museum. And I know that you are no strangers uh, to the idea of telling people about what you do and that museums uh, have been doing this for a long time. But I also know that sometimes we need to be reminded of how important this is and how much the public really does care about the work that we do. So I'm here to tell you today that museums, you have stories to tell. So this is something museums have been doing for a long time. This image here looks very familiar to you. This could be taken, uh, could have been taken in any of our museums. Uh, two individuals looking through a glass case. At this, at this uh, example, I can tell you that they're looking at some very precious gems. And they're amazed at what they see. There's a lot of information in this image. Right, and this is a very uh, kind of normal image uh, that we see in our line of work, right? It's a young child touching the mandible, the teeth of what I believe is probably a theropod or a cast of a theropod mandible. Amazed that this is a real creature that was alive at one point in time. So seeing this picture, we think of so many things. Um, we wonder um, what she's thinking, what the story is about what she might go on to be inspired to do in her life because of this experience. Of course, here is a whole family looking at a public facing fossil preparation lab. You can see the looks on their faces, how amazed they are. This is the experience that people have when they come to museums. Here is a museum docent. She is showing a youngster fossils that are actually part of the floor tiles in the main hall. And this will have a huge effect on this kid's life. And this is the kind of thing we see in museums. So why am I showing you this? You are no stranger uh, to these types of moments. We're all museum professionals here, so why am I taking your time with this? Well, because I was going to start off with this slide, but this would be super boring. So, I needed to tell a little bit of a story. I needed to capture your attention to make the point of the very thing that I'm here to say today, which is that it is important to tell stories and to embrace the side of our, uh, uh, of the stories that we have that is compelling to engage people in this way. Before we go any further, I should probably tell you who I am and why I'm here talking to you. Um, again, my name is Brad Dunn. I am the Web and Digital Engagement Director at the Field Museum in Chicago. I have over 20 years experience leading digital strategy and creative direction in a variety of disciplines you can see there on the screen. Um, it's mostly been in design and technology from social media to interactive design. Uh, I've also done some work in film and advertising and theater. At the Field Museum, I oversee our web, our social media, digital content and design. Uh, across a variety of digital channels. But today is not really about me. Today is about a story I want to tell, which is to share with you how important I think it is that as museums we embrace storytelling. And why, might you ask? Well, the reason is that people connect through story. Um, there's a great book by the author Jonathan Gottschall uh, called The Storytelling Animal, called How Stories, it's called The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. Um, he talks about how scientists have studied our brains when we watch movies on screen. There are neurons in our brains that recreate the feelings of real life. And um, uh, this is what gives us empathy for the people we see in stories, because we are literally having the feelings we project onto these stories. Um, so it's about embracing that opportunity we have to talk about the work that we do, but also to do it in a compelling way. Um, so for an example, I can talk to you about conservation ecologist Leslie D'Souza. She studies fish in the Amazon and has specifically studied the Arapaima. Or I can talk to you about conservation ecologist Leslie D'Souza 
working in the Amazon hands-on with the Arapaima fish. She is studying the um, impact that this uh, fish has in, in the local ecology, what it means to the local indigenous peoples, how it's important to them um, for both reasons of culture and for diet. Um, and I wanted to show it to you in these two ways because I'm demonstrating the difference between sharing a piece of information, which I think is what is very easy for us to do in science, versus telling a story. And if museums are to survive, I think that they must tell their stories. They have to embrace the potential they have as storytellers to tell compelling stories for the sake of fundraising, inspiring people to visit, convincing of the importance of their work. So whether you're at an art museum or a science museum or a library or some other mission-based institution, it's important that we tell compelling stories. So the way I look at this is through the lens of journalism. And journalism as a foundation for storytelling. That was my training in school was actually as a journalist. I think it's important as a way of accurately reporting on the science at our institutions. So we don't want to embellish and say things that are untrue. It's very important to be accurate with the, the, the work that we're talking about. But at the same time, it's okay to use the lens of editorial journalism to express a point of view. Now that, this is, this is a tricky one, right? We're not talking about expressing a point of view um, on the science uh, itself, because as we know, the science is the science, right? But it's about um, embracing a tone, uh, embracing a point of view that, that this thing that we're talking about is important. It's okay to take a stand in that way, to, to put a stake in the ground, as it were, to believe in the work that we're doing because if we believe in it and we understand that it's important and we have that point of view, that will come across in the stories that we tell and the work that we produce. It's important for engaging our audiences um, and to stay relevant and enhance our reputation. So marketers would call this enhancing our brand. Um, if you prefer not to use marketing speak, we can talk about um, enhancing our reputation. This is what helps drive attendance. It assists in fundraising um, to fulfill our mission um, and that is why that is why it's important to to embrace this and and to to um, uh, to do the storytelling to to help support the reputation of our institutions. So this slide might be uh, I, I don't know if this applies to to the broader um, you know uh, the broader world like in Europe here in the U.S. Um, there's a lot of research done uh, that shows that museums are credible sources of information. You can go to this website, website that you see on screen, ColleenDillon.com. Colleen Dillon Schneider is a very well-known researcher here in the United States. This is her work. This is um, a, a slide that's pretty well known to museum communicators such as myself um, that shows basically that aquariums and museums, history museums, science museums, all have a much, much higher level of credibility than say NGOs, government agencies, and even newspapers for better or worse. So we actually play an important role in, in the communities that we serve. People are looking to us as sources of credible information. So um, this is just another piece of, of research I cite when I'm working with my scientific colleagues. Um, and so let's take a moment and actually go through some of the work. Let's actually look at some of what it means for us at the Field Museum. Uh, and I wanna be clear, I'm not the one producing all of the work. I have uh, an amazing team um, that is actually doing the day-to-day -day work of, of producing for social media and for the web, for our blog. Um, so let's take a look at it. So um, we spend a lot of time bringing science to our audience. So here are two great examples. So you can see um, these are two different um, Facebook posts. One is uh, a Facebook live stream where we were behind the scenes with one of our postdoc researchers. Um, uh, talking about bats, actually, in this case. Um, and this, just this post right here, you can see reached 21,000 people, um, have 51 comments. So when we're doing these, um, our social media manager is looking at the comments as they're coming in, sending those questions to the curator or the collection manager, or in this case, the postdoc. Um, and uh, that way they're actually interacting with the audience in real time. It's, uh, it gives people a chance to get sort of behind the scenes with our science. I always say that our social media allows people to see the museum they can't see when they actually visit the museum. Um, and then uh, on the right, you see that this is a post for um, 
a thing that we produced a couple of years ago called the Beachgoers Guide to Lake Michigan Fossils and Rocks. So Chicago sits right at the edge of Lake Michigan, one of the Great Lakes in uh, North America. And um, we, uh, our collection manager actually created this blog post with us um, that's basically a guide for people to comb the beach and to be able to identify fossils as they're doing it. Um, we sit on top of a, a very um, famous, in, in, uh, in, from the paleontological perspective, an area called the Silurian Reef. And so there's a lot of fossil activity in this area. And as you can see, this post reached 61,000 people. This is very, very popular content. When we actually produced this, we weren't, we had no idea that this would be popular, but we thought, well, people like fossils and um, Lake Michigan is a big part of people's lives. So we put it out and um, this has been uh, one of the most popular pieces of content we've produced in the past three years. For sure, there are things we produce that don't uh, do as well. Um, but it's all about like finding um, the audience and knowing what's relevant to your local audience and putting it out there in ways that they can understand that are useful to them because we're not trying to convince them of um, all the important parts of the science that we know are important. We're trying to only forefront the things that we know are um, uh, relevant to them and their lives might be meaningful to them. So here we flip it around. We bring our audience to the science. So this was another one of our uh, researchers, uh, postdocs, who was actually out in Zambia and actually shot video for us when he was doing field work with his, uh, the rest of his team. And when he came back, he gave the videos to us and we turned it into a short series on Instagram, which ended up being very popular. People love this. They actually love to see, um, as much as they love to learn about the science, they love to learn how our scientists do the scientific work that they do. Um, in other instances, we're doing it more locally. This is actually uh, the collection manager, Paul Mayer, who um, produced the Beachgoers Guide to Lake Michigan Fossils and Rocks. Here he's giving our social media manager a tour along one of the beaches where he's just going along and finding um, fossils. And as he finds them, he's picking them up and talking about them. You can see this post reached over 17,000 people and had almost a thousand engagements, was shared a number of times with people. Um, and as we keep going, uh, w this is a little bit more about our exhibitions work. So some of it's more promotional in nature. So the one on the left is about Upsalika Women and Warriors. It's a show that we currently have running um, about the Upsalika native people in North America. And then on the right, you see that's our social media manager, Catherine Yurick, uh, on top. And she is talking to um, one of our artists and production people in exhibitions. And they are, her name is Kate Ulschmidt, and they are She's actually teaching her audience right now how she produces um, some of the materials for dioramas, so like miniature trees and things. Um, things like this, people love. It's, um, it has this element of being slice of life right now since it's 2020 and we're doing these things from home. But it also takes people behind the scenes and shows them how we're producing exhibitions, which is you know, a little bit the, more the art side of the science. It's sort of the presentation of the science in the public space. But, Kate is taking people through that work that we do. Um, and it's something that people really enjoy watching. And then we also like to embrace things at the museum that are um, sort of uh, in one category, just sort of pure joy and fun. And then on the other side is sort of um, things that aren't necessarily our science, but other projects we might have going on. So on the left, um, this is a very popular series for us. This is, um, we put someone in an inflatable Sue the T-Rex costume and send them around the museum and we document these adventures. And especially this year in 2020 with the pandemic, we, we really saw that what pe one of the things people are looking for is, is um, just a release, sort of moments of fun and joy. Mm -hmm. So it's not even really about the science, it's just people having fun. This is one of the most popular things we've, we'd ever produced. You can see this reached over 716,000 people on Facebook and had over 112,000 engagements. That's people clicking it, sharing it, commenting on it. Um, and so there's not really much science there. This is, there is a little bit um, uh, in the post itself where we remind people that uh, birds are actually dinosaurs, uh, but really most of the inflatable Sue the T-Rex things are just kind of pure fun and pure joy. And then on the right, this is one of our conservators uh, from, um, uh, from our anthropology group and he actually was using our 3D printer to print face masks uh, to, for uh, that we were gonna give to area hospitals to use um, in, um, 
in working with COVID patients. So that's not really our science at all. It's just sort of another behind the scenes moment that we wanted to share with people to help tell the story of the things that we do at the Field Museum. Um, and then turning to our blog, um, you can see here that uh, for the one there's the Beachgoers Guide to Lake Michigan Fossils and Rocks again. That's just a screenshot of the beginning of that blog post. We also have a team that does a lot of work in the Amazon, um, protecting and setting aside um, land to be untouched, working with local governments to, to set aside um, uh, parcels of land. So this is um, a blog post from April of this year where we're actually talking about that work. Um, we write it with our curators, but we actually have editorial oversight. So we look through and we see that work. Uh, we see what they write. We will um, do some rewrites. We want to keep the voice and tone very friendly and ready for like a mainstream uh, sort of general audience. It's not really written for academics. It's really written for non-academics, but people who are interested in science, or as we sort of lovingly call them, just our science nerds. Um, we also have a lot of fun. We have a Sue Twitter account, um, which is, um, an account that is run from the perspective, the personality of uh, Sue, our famous T-Rex. And here Sue can sort of get away um, with things that we would not attempt to do on our main account. Um, it's sort of like picking fun with, uh, picking, uh, picking, you know, sort of like fun fights with other institutions or having fun or teasing people or having sort of a fun or unique take on some things. Um, that is where we can have more personality through Sue than we're able to have just with, with our main account. Although we do have a lot of personality and fun with our, our, our primary accounts as well. Uh, Message Maximo is actually a chatbot we created that allows people to talk directly to Maximo. So they can um, get to him right through the website there and they can ask him questions. An example of a recent conversation you could see there, someone said, you know, said hello and asked him what kind of plants he eats and, how much at a time, and you can go through there and see um, that he actually answers the question. So it gives people a chance to, uh, for kids, they get to think for a moment that maybe they're actually talking to a dinosaur, but for adults, they understand that um, it's this experience we've created, but it's a fun way for them to um, learn more. He's this huge dinosaur that sits in our main hall. So it's a great sort of one-on-one -on -one experience they can have with that specimen. Um, and then I thought I would get in a little bit into like our strategy and our process. So one of the ways that we uh, go about this work is we have um, a framework called the field content plan. And it basically sets up criteria that we use to identify what's going to be our different levels of content um, that we call either the hero or the opportunity or a conversation or a news flash. Um, and then it creates a framework for us to work with people around the museum so that we're sort of aligned in what the primary content themes are month to month and quarter to quarter. And then people that run different channels, whether it's e-newsletters or e-newsletters with our, our membership or um, things through like our learning center, everyone can sort of align around the same type of content. They can share and reuse pieces of content. Um, and it helps us coordinate a content strategy across the entire museum. Um, we also have a style guide um, which is a set of standards for how we're going to write and, and, um, and design and create documents. It really gets into sort of like the voice and tone. Here you can see these are just some of the chapter headings. It's, it reads very much like an academic document that we all would have used uh, at university. Um, but it's really important because it, it, it helps us put forth a, um, a professional um, uh, face to the public so that we do things consistently across channels. And as I was thinking about this work and as it re might relate to people who are just getting into to sort of storytelling and setting up their own publishing processes, kind of put together just a very brief and very unofficial checklist of the things to think about and that we ask ourselves. So on the one hand, is, there's the audience. So who are they? What do they want? What devices are they using? Um, I think this is um, uh, easily the most important thing um, because there's a big difference between writing for an academic audience versus writing for a mainstream sort of general audience. We need to know, are they reading this on their phone? Are they reading on their iPads at night before they go to bed? Are they sitting at their desk in front of their computer? And what do they want out of the experience? Um, as I say, some of our curators, are they looking for um, science or, or science? So our curatorial staff write science papers we want to distill that down into science, just a small bit that people can take with them um, as part of, you know, 
as they're going about their day, they might come across our work in social media. I see it as an opportunity to communicate with someone who wasn't thinking about science at all and who now in this moment is um, thinking about how uh, lichens uh, reproduce with um, three different organisms within a species or thinking um, about um, the, the ecosystem and the effect that algae has um, uh, or one of, you know, any of a million uh, different things that we might talk about. Uh, my goal is to get that into people's lives every day and to get them thinking about it. Um, I think it's actually part of our mission um, to actually get that science out there, but I also think that it's um, helpful for the museum and helps enhance our reputation, which takes us to our second point, which is what is our goal? Um, and usually our goal is mission-based. It's enhancing the reputation. And if we could turn that into inspiring someone to come to visit, then all the better. That is also a goal for us. In terms of actually producing the content, the actual design of the content of the materials, um, you, you have to ask yourself what assets and materials you already have. Um, how do you want to create the content, whether it's through writing or photography or video, information graphics, quotes, testimonials, um, knowing that you're, you, it's going to be a mix of assets that you have and then also things that you create. You also have to keep the story relatable and approachable. You have to think about the length of the piece. Again, there's science and then there's science. So we want people to, um, we want things to be uh, an appropriate length so people will actually read and um, make their way through it. Also having a compelling headline is really important. So there's a lot of things that go into sort of what we call content design. It's usually writing, but it also can be mixed media. It could be video, photography, other things. Um, but I think that this is a good checklist as you're getting started to, to think about how to produce um, the content. And whenever I give a presentation, I always just like to um, throw out the structure of our team to give sort of context. So I oversee the digital and social team, but we sit uh, on the marketing team next to public relations, brand and advertising, audience insights and research. Um, and to get specific, to show like the people that I have on my team, how we produce this work. I have Caitlin Carney, who's a digital content and engagement manager. Um, she's head of content strategy, writes edits for social and the web. We have a social media manager, Catherine Urick, who, who runs our social media, writes most of the content, engages with our audience, does all the planning and uh, produces, produces content. Uh, we have a digital product specialist with Andrea Ledesma, a web developer with Roger Twan, and a UX and content strategist with Emily Suter. A lot of the work I'm talking about here today really was produced by those first two people you see on the team, Caitlin and Catherine. But this gives perspective as to how we've built out our team at the Field Museum and how we approach both the web and the social and other things like the chatbot that we mentioned. So um, I hope today uh, I've inspired you to embrace um, the opportunity that you have being a museum professional, being a scientist, to tell your story. It's important. It's important for our field. It's important for helping you accomplish your mission. And um, I'm just glad I could be with you today. So thank you very much.